I want to raise awareness around burnout and around how real it is and it's a real problem and we keep ignoring it and we all have this amazing career and we're getting burned out. We don't even know why and we need to fix this problem because we have to ask ourselves, how is this, you know, what is this costing us? Like it's costing us everything. Hello there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Orthopreneurs Podcast. I am here today with a special guest. Uh, they're all special guests, but today... Uh, somebody I really think you're going to like hearing about and, and hearing the conversation about because it's going to revolve around some really core issues. So please, everybody, give a warm orthopreneur's welcome to Dr. Robert Trujillo. Did I say it right, Robert? Y yes, you said it right. Yep. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, there was this great skit years ago on um, Saturday Night Live with um, Jimmy Smith, where he walks into a meeting as the only Latino in the whole meeting, and, and everybody around him is trying to put sort of... Hispanic words that are Americanized words and try to speak it with a like a Latino accent. So they're like, you know, are you, we're ordering lunch, Jimmy? Would you like some lunch? Would you like an enchilada? And they, they yeah. <laughs> it's a great sketch. So here I am, like wondering the eight different ways to say your name properly, and I'm just glad I got it right. So thank you. Yeah, no, that's really funny, actually. So you know, when I go into my new patient exam, I'll oftentimes, you know, introduce myself to the patient, and you know, my, you know, I'm like, hello, I'm Dr. Robert Trujillo. It's so nice to meet you. But then uh, one of my best friends was Venezuelan, and he was kind of telling me, oh, it's like Trujillo, like kind of how to say it. And so mm -hmm. then I started kind of like you know, just adding a little bit of flair to it. And then I caught myself actually a few months ago, almost like saying my name wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, cause I was just so focused on it. So it's actually like kind of a funny story. So I'm it's glad how uh, that happens. You yeah. Know? So I'm going to introduce everybody here in the Orthopedist podcast to Dr. Robert Trujillo. Yes. <laughs> Trujillo. <laughs> yes. So. But um, anyway, thank you for being here today. You know, for, for folks out there, um, you know, everybody, I've always been a firm believer that everybody out there, I don't care who you are, orthodontist, assistant, uh, you know, homemaker, I don't care. Everybody has incredible inherent net, you know, worth and value and so much they can bring to the table. You don't have to be someone who speaks on the stage at a big meeting to be on the podcast. And I think, I think Robert is a great example of somebody who probably is a lot like me, a lot like you, a lot like most of us who has some remarkable stuff to talk about today. So, um, if you don't mind taking a minute or two or whatever you want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself, your background, your training and uh, where you live and, and how you ended up where you are today. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, first, I just want to thank you for having me on uh, your show. Uh, your podcast has really just been exciting for me and it's meant a lot for me to be able to just kind of learn about other orthodontists with like interests and just really brings together this sense of community. So I really appreciate what you're doing. Um, so again, my name is Dr. Robert Trujillo and uh, um, I live here in the Seattle area, actually in Sammamish, Washington. I'm born and raised in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I am a husband and a father, and I have two daughters. Uh, they're six and nine, so still kind of in the thick of it. Uh, really, really fun You're ages. Not in the thick of it. <laughs> I have two daughters and a son. You're not in the thick of it yet, Robert. They're six and they're nine. Yes. I, I, you're about, <laughs> I that warn is true. you, you're it's... about to get into the thick of it very shortly. <laughs> yes. I'm just, just letting you stage. know right now. Yep. <laughs> with, with boys, six to nine is tough. With girls, just, I love my daughters, oh, yes. dearly. They're some of my best friends in the world, but it's about to happen, brother. Just yes. Embrace it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I'm a private practice orthodontist here in Sammamish. I bought my practice in December of 2013. I graduated from OU, Oklahoma. And uh, uh, kind of a funny story of how that all happened, actually. I wanted to move back to the Northwest. I was really focused on like Bend, Oregon, or um, like some other areas. And I had a few practice opportunities available. Um, but uh, Right after my first daughter was born, like a few days later, I had to leave to fly out here to interview for this practice opportunity. Um, so, so that was kind of like a crazy thing. I flew out here, did this, this interview, like overnight flew back, had this newborn and then like radio silence, didn't hear anything. So wow. I was moving forward with this practice opportunity in Bend, uh, which is really where I, I, I really wanted to be originally. Um, my family though, really wanted to be kind of more, not so much in the mountains, uh, you know, with snow and everything. So Bend, we Bend is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I lectured there 20 years ago and used to run along the, the side of the, what is it? The Deschutes river over there. Oh yeah. 
I mean, I got chased by, uh, I think a wolf was oh. following me the whole time I was running. Um, but I'm just telling people it is arguably one of the most beautiful places in the world. And I have a friend who practices dentistry there. Oh um, yeah. Yes. I, I absolutely love it. So I grew up, you know, and I'm from Oregon. So it was like kind of one of my favorite places, but anyways, um, on I, the East coast, Oregon is Oregon. I know, right? Yes. You need to translate for them on the East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, yeah. He's talking about Oregon. We're talking okay? about just Oregon. Wanted to, just yep. to make that clear for them. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's a good point. Um, so uh, yeah, so I uh basically didn't hear anything. I was like, oh, this opportunity is kind of postponed a little bit. And then it was like on my way to my graduation from orthodontic residency in the car, I get a call and I was like, Oh, hello. And it was like, Oh, congratulations. We chose you. And it was just like, what? Like completely out of nowhere. And it was really a practice of my dreams and a location of my dreams. Like it was just like all the things were coming together and they were like, we need you to start on Monday and this is Thursday. Um, and I'm going to my graduation and I have no plans of moving or anything. So, um, all my guests who came to watch my graduation basically helped me pack that weekend. And I flew out Sunday night, landed at two in the morning because our flight was really delayed and had to stay in a hotel that we lived in for several, several weeks while we tried to find a place and wow. started work the next morning. <laughs> and there was no transition because uh, the previous owner had a medical issue um, and had to leave abruptly and had kind of some fill-in doctors for several years. And so it was basically just me walking through the doors and the staff, and that was it. Wow. Um, so it was, uh, it was really uh, an amazing experience, though, to like to work with my team and they, I just learned so much from them and uh, they mean so much to me. Um, and I just kind of really was in that honeymoon phase. I like loved, I was building my practice. It was kind of like a startup in a lot of ways, uh, because there wasn't, you know, there was still a lot of goodwill, but, um, you know, there was a lot of instability at the time. Um, and over the years I built my dream practice. It's been more than I could have ever imagined, over the years, I I realized like kind of sneaking in through the back door, I was just kind of getting this, I was feeling a little satiated, a little dissatisfied uh, with things. And, uh, you know, kind of long story short, before I even knew what was happening, Glenn, I, I was full blown like in this like state of despair and hopelessness and full burnout, which I don't even know how it happened because I mean, I had everything I thought I wanted. Um, I had this amazing practice. I had, uh, you know, lots of new patients, my patient, like our relationships were great with my staff, with my team. Um, I have an amazing wife and kids, like all these things, but I had hit a wall. And even though I am a lifelong learner, I, I read probably like a book a week, sometimes a book a month, but uh, for the last 10 years at least. Um, I'm an avid learner. I'm like obsessed with it. Um, even with all of these these uh, tools that I've learned from reading, and it's always in personal development because I'm obsessed with it, I have still struggled uh, to be able to get myself out of that. And uh, uh, through a lot of, uh, of research and certifications and studies, I've I've managed to figure out how to get myself out of burnout, realign my life so that I could feel that fire like in my gut, that fire that's like, you're excited to grow your business. You're excited for like these goals and you're excited for all those things. And when you come from that state, just everything changes and uh, kind of a longer story than your few minutes there. Sorry, no, no, it's, it's but, um, but it's all relevant. And, you know, I have, I have very humble beginnings. I, you know, I've, you know, not to like sound uh, like too going into too many details, but basically I grew up, you know, homeless and had a very, very challenging childhood. I went to a different school every year, sent from kindergarten to high school, sometimes two different schools and and just a lot of uh, of challenges in my childhood, which I, you know, wouldn't change necessarily because they made me who I am today. And it's uh, something that that really has shaped me. But uh, burnout, the pain of the burnout that I was feeling was like significantly like night and day more traumatic than even like overcoming all the challenges that I had to face and overcome in my childhood. And I just really, uh, I want to raise awareness around burnout and around how like 
how real it is. And it's a real problem and we keep ignoring it. And we all have this amazing career and we're getting burned out. We don't even know why. And we need to fix this problem because we have to ask ourselves, how is this, you know, what is this costing us? Like it's costing us everything. Now, now I'm going to you know? get you to pause there because yeah. you've got me down like 50 questions already. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> so so I had to stop you there. I apologize. No. Let's go. Let's it's go good. I need that. I need that, Glenn. <laughs> I'm going to. Don't worry. Let's go back a little bit. Okay. Cause you glossed over something way back when. And you said, you know, you had a great life, great practice, great team, great family, great everything, but you were getting burned out. What how far into practice was that? And what were the things you were feeling, seeing, what was happening to make you realize? that it was burnout and not something else. Because to me, a lot of people say I'm burned out. Well, what does that mean? Does it mean you're stressed out? Does it mean you can't go any further? Does it mean that you, you wish you were in a different life? Could it be all of those things? Is it just your job or is it the overall life, right? There's a lot of questions there. So specifically right now, how far into practice of taking over that practice were you and how is it manifesting itself? Yeah, so I would say I was... Like since I started after that six month honeymoon phase, I recognized that I still loved it. Everything was great, but I recognized that I was like a little more tired than I should be when it came to like being at home. Um, but I just kind of pushed through it and didn't really acknowledge those warning signs. And then about year five, um, I I started just kind of like asking myself questions like, oh, what am I going to do? Like, what am I going to do? Like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, it were these thought patterns uh, that were happening. And I'm so glad you brought this up because burnout is such a, you know, cliche term. It's like, oh, oh God, I'm just like, I worked all, I'm so burnt out. And it's completely different than like a diagnosis, you know, where right. it's like pure emotional and pure physical and, uh, and just mental exhaustion from, from a le maintaining a level of stress for such an extended period of time that those three realms basically just can't operate anymore. And I, the thoughts I were thinking were really just kind of not helping. It's like, what am I going to do? Like, I don't know what, I don't think I can do this forever. And then I started feeling sad. Like, you know, this is my career. Like I went to school, I borrowed a ton of money to do this. Like I want, this is what I wanted. And now when I think about my future, I start to get scared. Like, I don't know if I can do this for another 10 years, 20 years, 30 okay. years. And, um, uh, and can I, can I ask you the question about that? Yeah. So when you were getting in the car to go to work, how many days a week were you working doing ortho? Not working uh, on the practice? three. I mean, I worked three to three and a half days. Take, okay. I took 11, 12 weeks off a year. Okay. So you were living a life of roughly three days a week, working give or take 40 weeks a year. So you're working about 120 to 130 days a year, give or take. Mm -hmm. When you get in the car in the morning at that point, are you getting in the car going, crap, I do not want to be going here today. I, I wish I didn't have to go to work. I wish I could stay home and not have to do ortho. Was it number one? And was it ortho or was it just the stress of life and everything coming on top of you? Would you could I at that moment have said to you, hey, Robert, here's job B. It's totally different. Just don't don't point your car towards your office. Go to job B instead, w not ortho. Would that have made it easier or was it something completely different emotionally? So question one, did you get in the car and not want to go to work or not want to get out of bed in the morning to go to work? And two, was it the ortho Was it the or that particular practice that was causing it? You know, it wasn't that I didn't want to go to work. It was more the hopelessness that I wasn't going to feel alive again Got or on. that I was going to feel like like that that authentic, like deep passion. Um, I mean, when I showed up at work, I gave like 110%. And, you know, I had to ramp myself up sometimes. I had to play music and really like get in the mode. And like there, I, I've, there were times when I've even like sat in my car before walking in the office, just kind of like, okay. Okay, I'm going to show up and I just like walk through and, and, you know, and it's really who I am, but it just felt like it just took so much energy. So I wouldn't have gone to job B um, because my commitment to, to my patients and, you know, to the practice, it was more just the hopelessness of like, I have this pain and I don't know how to fix it. Uh, what that's was, what really was causing that pain. Do you know, in retrospect, what was causing it? 
Yeah. You know, what was causing it, you know, really is that my life was completely out of balance. And so, um, you know, one of the things I have really discovered over the years is that we all have motivations to do something and they're all driven by our human needs. So we all have like specific human needs that we have to achieve or we have to meet in order to, uh, you know, that's what kind of motivates us. And right. what I learned is that, um, you know, when we ask ourselves the question, like, what is the most important thing to me in the world? Um, it could, I would say, you know, it's my family and my kids and my wife. And I want, this is exactly what I want. This is the exact result I want. But then you have work where it's like, oh, I really want, you know, to grow my practice to this amount. I really want to be a good leader. I really want to treat my patients the best I can and have this incredible culture. And uh, yes, I wanted both of them, but my work was meeting my needs more than my family and more than my kids. And I found myself more motivated to focus my energy and everything towards work. And what I've learned in retrospect is that that, you know, that's because it was meeting more of my needs of, you know, certainty and, and adventure and significance and um, contribution and all of those things. So I was really kind of focusing my energy on that. Meanwhile, what was most important to me in my life, I was neglecting. Um, I still was present with my family and, you know, I love them and would do anything for them, but my daily actions did not were not congruent with that direction. And so I found myself really just kind of wrapped up in my work so much. And then I couldn't figure out how to not want that. Like, I almost like forgot how to play with my kids because it was like, oh, I, I feel more satisfied when I'm doing this like progress towards this big work goal, even though that's so, so really it's all about clarity and knowing it, yeah. what exactly you want in your life. And I sorry, I'm like notorious for just spinning around no, in circles okay. there. So, okay. You, you hit some great points and, <laughs> you know, I think a couple of observations, I think, you know, being where I am in this chair, I hear a lot of stories. A lot mm -hmm. of people come to me on messenger and Facebook a lot of people hit me up on Instagram or wherever it might be. I get a lot of, just like you, right? I get a lot of people say, hey, thanks for the podcast or thanks for the meeting or thanks for the article or whatever it might be, which is what I love, right? I love connecting people to things. Um, but I hear a lot of stories. And what you're describing is so commonplace in orthodontics. We all, as orthodontists, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull myself out of this conversation because my path is radically different, as you know, from most orthodontists, right? I wasn't mm -hmm. a... 27 or 26 or 29 year old graduate of, high, of uh, ortho. Now, I was a 47 year old graduate from ortho with three kids who were growing, who all of them were older than your kids are now when I came out of ortho. So my path is different in so many ways. But orthodontists, and I, I post on this, I write on this, I talk about this, I tell everybody when I stand in front of a non ortho crowd, orthodontists are a remarkable breed of individual right? Just by the self-selection process and the external selection process, it's harder to become an orthodontist than it is to get into Harvard Business School, right? It, it's, it's harder because half the people who apply every year are going home without getting in anywhere. It's not like they didn't get into their first choice or the second choice. They're not going anywhere. And so the people who are in ortho are, that I've met are really smart, really self-aware people, really in touch with their who they are and what they are and their mission, right? They're, they get the conversation quicker than most people do. They might have been a, a black belt or a long distance, you know, award-winning runner or speak multiple languages or did mission work in a foreign country for two years or cured world hunger or cured cancer, you know, or, or solved COVID, right? Like they have these incredible accolades that they're just, it's a part of their being and who they are. And then They've been driving, driving, driving to be top of their dental school class, top of their ortho, you know, get through ortho, come out. And now they go to social media where they see all these really cool, good looking, all together orthodontists repping their practices on Instagram and social media. And they find themselves sitting there in their practice, you know, which might be a little slow or might be a little too crazy or a little hectic or understaffed. And there's a great, there's a great um, Jerry Seinfeld uh, sort of article or section. He writes in his book, Sign Language, from years and years ago. And he talks about, and it reminds me of orthodontists, where he says, 
have I could do my Jerry Seinfeld voice for you now if you wanted to, and it would make oh. it more fun. But um, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, do it. I, I, you know, I don't know if it'll translate on onto the sound. For I'll try it. Here, but he goes. Did you ever notice that when you go to a store, right? You, you were, <laughs> sorry, I, I had to pull it. No, I'm closing my eyes. I could feel it. No, it's perfect. <laughs> I'll, 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 I can pull out my Jerry Seinfeld anytime you want. So, <laughs> did you ever notice when you go to a store and you put on a shirt and the shirt is eighty bucks? And the music's pumping and everybody's lo- right. And he talks about how you buy this $80 shirt back in the day, which is probably a $200 shirt now. And the music is pumping and there are cool people everywhere. It's a trendy store and you get this shirt and it's a trendy shirt and you're trying it on with trendy music and you go in a cool changing room and you put it on and you look in the mirror and there's trendy music and trendy people and trendy salespeople and you got a trendy shirt and you're trendy. And then you get home and there's no music and there's no people. And there's no anything. And you're just some chump who paid up $200 for a shirt. And he says it as a joke the way he tells it. But at the end of the day, it's a great short analogy for the rest of life. You worked really hard to get to ortho and you hung out with good looking, smart people who are really accomplished. And you were told you were going to be successful and you were given the keys to the executive washroom when you went to GORP a month in the program. And you've been told how wonderful you are and how selective you are and how great you are. And now you bought a practice and you were selected. You, Robert, were selected among all the people. It was special. You got it. And now you're sitting in your your office or in your car and you're overwhelmed by the number of patients who are coming in and by a team that may not be aligned with your vision and a big bank note and a school loan and all the time you put in. And you're just some guy sitting at home with a $200 shirt. Right. And I think you see the cool people on social media and you say, that should be me. Why don't I feel like that? And again, I've never felt it, but I've heard the story from so many people to tell you you're not alone. And right now, this second, I guarantee you, someone or many people listening to this are feeling the exact same thing. Hey, wait a minute. I bought the cool shirt and the cool stuff around the cool people and I'm four years in. Why don't I feel as cool? Why don't I feel as relaxed? Why don't I feel as in control? Why don't I feel like I'm making the money? Why don't I feel like I'm getting great outcomes on every single patient? Because when I go to lectures, I see amazing outcomes. Why do my outcomes not look like this all the time? I get them from time to time, but why do mine take so long, right? And those are the people I respect the most in the world are the ones who stop and look at it and go, wow. The bill of goods I was promised is not what I've got, as opposed to the people who go, it's amazing. It's great. When it really isn't, my outcomes are amazing. I know how to finish cases. I finished a total of 200 cases so far. I'm a genius in finishing cases. I know that's the dangerous road. You, my friend, I think we're in a really good place to know that, hey, wait a minute. I need some help here. I need to get it. And so I want to segue a little bit into the next step of your life, right, which is we got Robert Tujillo the the orthodontist now we're in your life you're moving into another direction in the near future where you're going to maintain being an orthodontist but you're going to take everything you've learned and use that to help others get through this right so i want you to talk a little bit about that if you don't mind yeah so um you know i'm an orthodontist for the last 10 years and that's like my full identity so it's been it's definitely kind of not full identity in a bad way, but I mean, I've really just invested a lot into it emotionally and that's kind of what contributed a lot to my burnout. But even before orthodontics, I have always been driven and motivated and just really inspired by the psychology around uh, high achievement, high performance, goal setting and uh, happiness and fulfillment. And uh, I've been, you know, in a lot of ways, like a coach (laughs) to my friends and my peers uh, for much of my adult life. Uh, What makes a good coach is not really sharing, you know, perspectives or or tools at all all the time. It's actually more about uh, listening and knowing uh, to helping your client ask like the right questions, because the questions you ask yourself are what's going to get you out of things. Um, If you're asking yourself bad questions, like like I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, I'm not going to know what to do, but if I'm asking myself questions like, you know, I want to be fulfilled, like this is what fulfillment looks like for me, then I can start taking the daily actions to move me towards that. Even when I don't feel like it, even when it emotionally doesn't feel like, like, Oh, I don't really want to like do this because it doesn't, you know, it's not, but it is what I want. And that's what is driving me. And so I'm going to do that anyway. So 
<clears throat> so becoming a life coach for me is something I've always thought of for really the last 20 years. I, uh, <laughs> for in dental school, I was given a book. It was a five, where, where, what was it called? It was like, where will you be in five years from now? It was like a Starbucks book. Right. I filled that thing out. Like you wouldn't believe. I mean, it was like, like I was taking a college course. I filled it out all the way through, like so in depth and everything in that book in my life, like happened in those, in five years later. And it was just something I was so like proud of, like, wow, I really like, I created a vision and I followed through and I did it. And uh, um, even when I bought my practice, I gave that book, I had it customized uh, legally to where I could give it with like my custom logos to every patient. And because I really wanted them to follow their dreams. That's and awesome. so, you know, teaching and helping others follow their dreams has always been a theme in my life and something that just fills me up. And if I could sit around and chat with any group of people, it's almost always going to be like, hey, like, wh what do you want in life? Like, what are your goals? Like, th that, those are the things that really fill me up. And, uh, um, about eight years, like probably eight years ago, I started kind of more taking courses and all of my CE, I started spending a lot of it, you know, you know, I did my, my ortho CE, but I also spent a large amount of my time with, uh, kind of learning high performance and just like the, the mental side of things and the mindset side of things and the science of goal achievement, all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, I uh, decided that I am going to be, a, I, this is what I want to do. I want to be a life coach. So I became certified and then uh, one certification lead to another one and then, and then a third one. And of course, you know, we're all orthodontists. So we're just like overachievers in a lot of way. Uh, but I really just wanted to be well-rounded in different areas. And I decided uh, many, many years ago that December, 2024, so next December, um, next, next December, I was going to kind of transition out of private practice to really open my, my, my coaching firm. And, uh, I've had my own coach, you know, life coaches use their own coaches too. I've, I've invested, you know, huge amounts of money in coaches over the years. And, uh, uh what I've decided is, you know, why I, I don't necessarily want to wait till 2024. Like, this is what I really want. Like, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. Wow. And so I am kind of transitioning and opening my, my life coaching practice. It's called Robert Trujillo consulting. Um, and consulting is different than coaching. And I can, you know, touch on that later, but uh, basically the program I've created is a transformation to thrive program. And it's basically to help, you know, our, orthodontists who are like high achievers, they, they really have like the opportunity to have all these things they want, but they're just feeling like the pain and, you know, the drive to work where they're just like feeling like hopeless or maybe low energy. You get home from work, you're staring at the wall. You can't play with your kids. You can't have meaningful conversations and just help them realize that like, Hey, it doesn't have to be this way. Like we can get you from here to here, we can get you to coming home from work with more energy than when you left and having like all of the, the, the juice and the why, and the, the emotion to, to play with your kids and to be present with your wife or go out with friends and, and really kind of focus on balancing your life. Um, that's something that, that I'm just really passionate about and really excited. And it completely gets me, uh, to like a whole new level of fulfillment. I love orthodontics. And when I'm at, and I know I do, cause when I'm here, I mean, I lose track of time. I could see all my patients all day and just be like, Oh wow. That was like, like my life is flying by so fast because I love it, but there's just something a little bit different that I wanted for this. And, you know, this is a, it's a big transition for me, but I'm really excited to help uh, those who are going through what I went through, uh, kind of break through to the other side and, and really just create the life that they love. Awesome. A, a question and a comment question first, and then I'll give my comment second. Uh, first, obviously kudos to you. Um, I've written about sunk cost bias many times, meaning that people find themselves in situations that are not good ones where the outcome is not going to be good, but they justify staying there because of the amount of time, energy, or money they put into it already right? You know, some cost bias on a home, you know, or, or, or a project or a relationship in your sense of career. Hey, I've been an orthodontist. I applied to all these schools. I spent 
grade 23, becoming an orthodontist. I've been doing it for 10 years. You know, I should just keep going. And so kudos to you for fighting sunk cost. That's not the comment. The question is, is it your belief that for the orthodontist you're helping to help them get to be where they want to be? Is it, and I'll give you an A or a B, is it helping them understand how to thrive within being an orthodontist or is it helping them understand that maybe orthodontics is not the place they want to be and they want to be doing something different? What are your thoughts on that A versus B concept? And then I'll throw out my comment afterwards. Yeah, I think that a lot of it is to really just serve the orthodontist. So it could be A, it could be B. Um, If they want to do something different and that's what really fulfills them, then kind of being there to support them and help them kind of break down their limiting beliefs and break down the fears to kind of help them move towards something that's ultimately going to lead to a, a happier, more fulfilling life. But in contrast, a lot, you know, I once I was kind of cured of my burnout and kind of rebalanced in my life, like orthodontics is like an amazing career. And we have an opportunity to transform so many lives. And so really, my passion is really just helping them find what's best for them. And I think what we will find is that most orthodontists do love what they do. They just need to create that balance around it and staying in that career uh, that would really be more of what we would see. Cool. And so another comment and another question. Um, So my comment is, we hear a lot, and and again, I talk about this a lot. We hear a lot about people saying, you know, if I I ask a 35-year-old orthodontist, why do you work so hard? What would you like to achieve? The the first answer reflexively, without even making a thought about it, is I want to spend more time with my kids. And I've written about this and I've podcasted about it. I want to spend more time with my kids. I want to spend more time with my kids. And that's not an attack when I talk about this. I believe that today's generation is spending way too much of their life focusing on their kids. Um, It's a generational thing. I'm 54, 55, and you can call me an old man and say, you know, Glenn, things were different back then. But I see too many parents making this sort of, again, if you go back to social media, you can count, you can't count, it's uncountable, the number of accounts posted by people who only post pictures of them doing things with their kids all day long. From the time they wake up to the time they go to bed, here's my child waking up. Look at my child having breakfast. Look at my child, you know, after breakfast. Look at my child at lunch. Look at my child. There's nothing about themselves. It's <laughs> yes. all about their kids. And studies are starting to show that, you know, A, it's not good for the kids that you're, you're there all the time. And B, it's not good for you to be there for your kids all the time. Like you said best, yeah. it needs to be balanced. And all too often, if I said to 35-year-old orthodontists who are five years into their career, If you could do anything, if you could stop doing ortho right now and do anything, what would it be? Instantly. Oh, I'd spend more time with my kids. And I go, time out. Like, wouldn't you want to take a trip with your wife maybe to Machu Picchu? Wouldn't you like to go climb a mountain? Wouldn't you like to learn how to play guitar or drums or some instrument? Wouldn't you like to become a black belt or learn something? Wouldn't you love to learn another language? Wouldn't you like to focus on growth or knowledge or or learning about the existential secrets of the universe? Like, you're going to spend time with your kids right? You come on, kiss them, hug them, have energy, have dinner with them, enjoy it. But I remember in my home and all the f- homes of my friends' parents, and even people who came 10, 15 years later, parents didn't live for their kids as much as they do today. And I think it's playing a large role in the mental health of a lot of folks who somehow feel, I need to spend more time with my kids. And I understand we all love our kids. We all want to spend time with them. But you also need to spend time with you, you need you. <laughs> and, and that's the part that I try to explain to people. And I'm sure as a life coach, you can appreciate the value of you need to recognize that your self-worth and your love and your kindness and your happiness doesn't come from external factors. You can go love your children uh, a little less and still be a great parent as long as you are happy with who you are. And so when you mentioned, you know, being around kids, I, mean, I just want to tell people out there, it's okay to work your office and enjoy it and have a great time with it and, and have balance in your life and not come home and want to, I know parents who come home from a full day of ortho and play with their kids for three straight hours, like legitimately three straight hours, then dinner, then go. And they wonder why they're burned out. And I'm like, because you can't do that. It just, that it's not how a human being was designed. Right. And it, it stifles their development to some extent. But what I wanted to ask you, um, when someone's burned out, right. Cause I don't see you as the normal guy, Robert. I see you as a very systematic kind of fellow right? Everything you've done in your life that we've talked about or that I know about you, 
you're systematic. You write, you do things in a very good way, right? Whether it's dental assisting stuff, right? Or life coaching or your practice. So when someone's burned out, how much of it is intrinsic, meaning I just, oh, I'm so stressed. I can't do this. And how much of it is extrinsic from my team? I just, I'm working short staffed. I can't hire enough team members right now. I'm, I'm working three people short in my practice. I'm wearing every hat that I shouldn't be wearing because I got nobody else. It's not a micromanagement problem, right? Which you can work around. It's me just trying to keep my head above water and pay my bills because I can't hire good help today. I can't hire anybody. Nobody's applying and I'm working way harder. When you work with somebody about burnout, how much of it is something that you can control and how much of it is coping with the things you can't control? Hey, it's okay. Your patient's going to be waiting 20 minutes and you got to be okay with that because if you try to stay on time, your mental health is going to suffer. You know where I'm coming with that question? Yeah, no, I think that the majority of it is going to be intrinsic because we can it's really our thoughts. Like we have all these thoughts around everything and that's what's creating the feelings and what's creating the results in your life. I truly believe that your practice is like a reflection of what's happening in your mind. If you're feeling stressed out and overwhelmed and understaffed, like you're basically kind of creating that for your office. And we're all going to go through like times of pain where things are out of control. And we, you know, we all experience pain as humans, but Suffering is when we feel hopeless to change it, when we feel like I'm never going to be able to hire this person, I'm never going to be able to do this, and and then we're now suffering. And when we're suffering, we're hopeless and we're not really able to kind of solve the problem. So I feel like the to transform from I am burnt out, I am exhausted, like I don't have any energy, I can't think clearly, to I feel alive, I feel like a kid again, I'm laughing, I'm having fun, all, you know, this, this goal to kind of transform through that process. The first step is really just to get clarity on what it is you want, what thoughts are you having repetitively, and how are those thoughts hurting you? How are they helping you? Uh, you don't have to indulge in every thought you have. If you're feeling like, oh, I'm behind, I'm behind, and then you like, decide to just like run with that thought for the whole day, thinking it, ruminating, right. spinning around it, you're going to, it's going to completely drain you. You could let that thought pass and kind of focus on a different thought that's going to serve you and it's going to help you heal. So the first thing is really getting clear on what we want and having enough self-awareness to know that our emotions are just, uh, they're basically outcomes of our thoughts and they are, they're really just kind of clues on what needs am I not are not being met and, you know, start kind of coming up with ways to solve that problem and then kind of working more through identity. Like what are your beliefs around who you are and your identity and then kind of working through what your strengths are and, and with all of that in mindfulness and how to actually reduce stress on a scientific level uh, with more presence. Uh, I feel like we can weather this storm of, you know, the great resignation, a tsunami of turnover that we're going through right now. Uh, but it's, it really needs to start with like, you know, being respectful to ourselves, thinking positive thoughts that are not going to harm us and choosing not to engage in a thought if it's not serving us. And then just getting the mindfulness and the self-awareness to really like know that it's okay for me not to stress about this right now. It, I can go back and I can deal with that stressful thought when I feel healthier and more resilient, but right now I'm not going to do that. Um, I feel like if we can really kind of live that way a little more intentionally, we'll be able to weather this a lot in a lot healthier and happier way. God bless you, man. I love, I love what you're saying. Uh, it's funny because when I started going to a therapist uh, a while back, you know, because I believe in therapy, even when you're feeling great, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, when you too. work out when you're already in good shape, you don't have to wait to get fat to start working yes. out. <laughs> you don't have to wait till you have a nervous breakdown or you're depressed or you're burnt out to go see a therapist. And I strongly recommend everybody see some sort of mental health expert at some point to help them along. But they said to me, you know, because I always tell people like, I can't really understand true anxiety and depression because I've never been anxious or depressed. Why? Because I found out that one of the things I accidentally do is I compartmentalize bad things and put them aside. I, I put them away and I refuse to allow them to take 
root in my brain, but I bring them back later when I can be more introspective about them. And it's accidental for me, right? It's a blessing. Mm -hmm. Like there's many things I've not been gifted with, (laughs) but this is one of those that like what you're talking about now resonates with me. It really speaks to me because when negativity starts overwhelming me or something's starting to hit me, I can easily put that in a box, put it away in my brain and go, you know what? But I'm not gonna let that deal with me. Now, right now we've got a bigger issue we got to deal with that's going to, I need to stay in a positive place because if I go negative, the whole place is going to fall apart right now. And we need to, so, and we all go negative at times. You know, I just recorded a podcast on being Eeyore versus Tigger, right? Like, and having (laughs) those people in your life, but everything you're saying is so incredibly important. And yes, to you listening out there, your life is wonderful. Things are great. Now there's going to be some rain in your life. It's going to happen. It can't be September in Seattle all the time. It's going to be November or December and rain and darkness are going to come. And the faculties and the way you prepare for them are just as important as when you go through it. So what what Robert's talking about here is, is I think, imperative for all of us to make sure that you're checking in with yourself and that you understand who you are and that you have people like him in your life so that when things are going great, they get better. When things are not going so great, they get better. And that's the name of the game. And I, I just want to say thank you so much for what you're doing, Robert. I think you're going to make a huge difference in people's lives. And if they want to learn more about you, if they want to work with somebody who really understands what it is to be an orthodontist, right? You didn't come out of school a year or two ago. You've been practicing for almost 10 years. Um, if someone wants to reach out to you to learn more, or to talk to you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, you can uh, reach me by email at info at ortholifecoach.com. Um, or you can, you know, find information on my website, schedule a, a coaching session at ortholifecoach.com. Ortholifecoach.com. Yep. And it's not specifically for orthodontists. It's actually like aligning lives. <laughs> so it's yeah. like a fun little I love that. You know, play on words there. Straightening out crooked lives. Yep. You got it. So, yeah. um, and you know, it's as orthodontists, we know all about solving problems and all about like, oh, like reacting to every appointment, like kind of making sure and getting it fixed. Um, but we need to apply that to our own life. If you are burnt out and feeling stuck and you can't just keep you need to do something different. Like we need to find different tools and different solutions uh, if what you're doing is not working. And yeah. so that's uh, that's what this program is all about. And, and before I let you go, what I love the most about your message um, is you didn't tell you you didn't say I'm going to help you make more money. You didn't say I'm going to help you get cooler things, or or X or Y or Z or some sort of end goal. You're really helping people understand how to get through life in a way that makes them happier, more joyful, uh, you know, and, and like you said, more youthful, if you will, with more joy. And, yes. And, yep. And, and to me, that's that's huge. And so I just want to say thank you so much for being a part of today's podcast. Thank you for reaching out to me and because it's been a pleasure getting to know you better, obviously. And um, again, if anybody wants to reach out, get them at info at ortholifecoach.com, correct? Yep, that's it. Right on. Well, thanks again, Robert. Wishing you the best. Can't wait to see you at a million other events or a million times. Yeah. And and, uh, and again, people, there is no shame around mental health. I want to say that now. You heard me say I see a therapist. There's no shame. I, I respect you more for doing these sorts of things because, like I said, it's easy for us to applaud the person who finishes a triathlon, right? When it's when it's physical, we need to start applauding people when they go through the triathlon of mental health. When they, get, when they get the help they need and they change their lives to the better. Um, because I think times are changing and we need to understand it's important for us to live our best lives. And so um, reach out to them, info at Ortho Life Coach, and uh, we'll see each other at some point down the road, Robert. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was, uh, this was a lot of fun. I really uh, appreciate you and uh, uh, the opportunity to help share my message and my mission in life. So thank you so much. My pleasure.